few more people joining. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Juuso Kantonen. I'm a UX team lead, and on my day-to-day -day work, I'm helping our customers with any UI or UX topics. And with me, I have Rolf Smeds, who's the product owner of the design system. So Rolf is responsible for the components and also the Lumo team. So our topic for, for this presentation is theming and styling button applications. And this is something that everyone loves, right? Uh, how many of you haven't ever had to write a single line of CSS? Okay, so we might have <laughs> one or two. So it's, it's very relevant for, for pretty much everyone. Um, did you enjoy doing that? Yeah, yeah, some. A couple There's of guys some. enjoyed it. Um, maybe you had to apply a few, few hacks here and there to get, get the styling that you, that you wanted. From personal experience, I can tell that it's, it's super easy to cre start creating a mess in CSS. And uh, <coughs> this presentation will be giving you a few techniques on how to avoid that, how to keep your styling, styling clean and avoid, avoid those dirty hacks. <coughs> And as a bonus, we will be showing you some techniques on how to uh, style your applications without writing a single line of CSS. So let's get to it. Uh, before going into, into code, I want to show you a few examples of, of styled button applications. And the background to this is that we sometimes hear that uh, the designers, especially working with Baden, they might not really know what, what are the capabilities regarding styling. They might say that, no, we don't really want to, want to go with Baden because it, the look and feel isn't what they, are, what they are looking for. So here's a few examples. All of these are made by our UX designers for our real customers. So the first one is a, like a material inspired look and feel. It has a green color palette, quite a lot of data on the screens. The next one is more of a, like a grayscale color scene with the red accent color. This one is more lightweight and minimalistic. Uh, all the elements are quite, quite big and it's quite focused on doing one, one thing at a time. And it's also optimized for, for like mobile use cases. On the other hand, this is quite, quite compact in sizing. There's a, a, a lot of data on screen at a time. The color seam is a bit more playful and, and colorful. And as the last example, we have one that has quite uh, put a lot of emphasis on clear visual hierarchy. Uh, so there's very clear sections in the, in the UI. And the color is only used for like highlighting and statuses and, and so on. So quite different look and feel from each other and all still based on, on the on the Lomo and the same set of components. Another thing that I want to show is the team add-ons. So these are available in the in the Vani directory. You might be familiar with, uh, with component add-ons like a toggle switch or a calendar component. So these are similar to that but they only contain CSS. So these are customizations that are built on top of Lumo and they are loaded as a dependency in your application. So the first one we have, this is the like default styling, <coughs> what, what Lumo looks like and a, and a sample UI for that. So it has been the default since Valentine. Varin, this is the first, first of the team add-ons. So it's called Breeze and it's kind of like a tailwind inspired styling. The input fields have a, have a border, there's a bit more shadows, which you probably can't see through the projector. Uh, the color palette is slightly adjusted and so on. Not a dramatic difference to, to Lomo, but a bit different flavor. The next one is called Parity. This is actually based on the Goldman Sachs design, design system. It's a bit more compact in sizing, quite optimized for clarity, I would say quite pronounced pronounced components and, and use of colors. A third one is uh, called Carbon, clearly inspired by IBM's carbon design system. 
uh, it has quite distinguishable identity in it. Uh, the stars are quite sharp and, and like boxy in a way. So those are available. We also have uh, started doing like a material tree uh, team, but the Google specifications for that have, have been uh, changing and not, not fully complete. So we haven't finished that work yet. So all of those can be can be loaded as a dependency in your in your application. They can be further styled, uh, so you can write your own own styling on top of those. Uh, these are not like part of the Vardin's official offering, so these are third-party add-ons in a sense. All three of these happen to be written by uh, UX designers who are Vardin employees, but they they don't get the like same level of support as the as the official things do. All of these are based on Luma. So uh, if, for example, a new component gets added, added into, the, into the framework, uh, that will be uh, falling back to Luma styling. So it's a good thing that the styles won't be broken. The, the team add add-ons don't need to immediately be updated to show something on screen, but there's a Luma on the back. And I'm calling this a, a 100 hour head start for, for styling. So you could take one of these as a starting point for your defining your own styles, use them as is, or just copy the sources and start modifying and making it your, your own. Now we get to the actual uh, styling parts. So what we'd like to emphas emphasize is uh, keeping your styles organized. Here I have uh, two pictures. So, uh, as I mentioned, the CSS has kind of a tendency to turn, turn into a mess over, over time. And there's a number of reasons why, why this happens. The uh, CSS uh, doesn't work the same as, as Java code, for example. Uh, the loading order is, is meaningful in, in CSS. The, the styles are inherited, inherited across the components that uh, specificity uh, the same styling can be defined in, in multiple, multiple places. So the left side here uh, represents the outcome of doing small tweaks here and there. Maybe something doesn't work, so you apply more styles on top and add, add some strings and strings and glue and hope that, that everything stays, stays together. Um, so the fact is that finding some individual line, something that affects your styling from this pile can be quite, quite difficult. So it's a, it easily turns into like a maintenance nightmare. The right hand side represents a, a well organized library. So there's clearly like a, a system behind this. Someone might say there's a design system that these are based on. So all the, all the styles have like very clear places. They are easy to find and easy to, easy to modify. There's an index in those. So how to achieve this kind of like clean and organized library. The first step is to uh, create uh, stubs for your uh, styles. So all the components you have, all the UI patterns, all the view templates, etc., all the repeating patterns. And how do you know what you're going to be needing in your application? Uh, having uh, defined a design system helps, helps in that. So already in the design system, there should be uh, like basically documentation of, of what, what is going to be going to be existing in the application. I guess you could say that whenever you identify a pattern in your design system, you might as well create a style sheet for it yeah. because you're probably going to need to add some CSS to it anyway. Right. So the next step is to uh, use small style sheets instead of putting all your styling in one single monolithic, monolith monolithic style sheet. And also avoid these kind of like one-off tweaks that, okay, I'm slamming some more specific styles on top and maybe I'll come back later and, and fix it. You never do. <laughs> um, also, the last tip is to avoid the important declaration cost. That kind of breaks it that you, you will find yourself putting more and more important styles, more, more specificity on the, on the selectors. So, um, you could see the, the styling as this kind of like hierarchy or, or pyramid. And the foundation here is the well-defined shared styles. So these are the customization that applies to 
your whole application. For example, this might be like setting a font family for like across your whole application. Then one level higher is the component styles. And this is styling for individual components. And here again, I'm referring to components. Those might be buttons or fields, but also more like uh, combinations of these smaller components like main navigation or header bar, more like uh, compositions. So for example, uh, the component styles could be used to set a font color for a disabled combo box. And on the top of the pyramid, we have the uh, view styles. So these are styling uh, related to one single use case, maybe styling like one specific component in one specific view. So that might be setting a font color for a very specific combo box in an employee's view, for example. So basically the view styles are something that you should try to minimize and it's kind of uh, a hint that if you start having a lot of view styles that probably you're repeating yourself and you should do better work with defining the patterns and moving them kind of like lower uh, more, more towards the component styling. Okay looking into the uh, shared styling which was our, our shared styles which was our foundation so the first thing you want to do is identify your design tokens. Um, the design tokens might be known as uh, primitives or particles in, in different methodologies. The idea is that they are the smallest repeatable design decisions that you might have. These might be colors, these might be fonts, these might be sizing or spacing. Um, if you start paying attention to the body and create brand that we have, have in the event, it's made out of basically this color palette that, that I have on the, on the screen. There's a gradient, there's few colors. We are using the same uh, typography style throughout the website, throughout the t-shirts, throughout the print materials, the presentations. And that is basically what it takes to create a consistent visual style. And consistency also uh, means that the implementation for those styles is gonna be as clean and dry as possible. Now we're finally getting, getting to some uh, CSS samples. So the first topic is, the, uh, is called CSS variables. They're also known as CSS custom properties. And here uh, I'm showing a syntax for, for a CSS variable. So it starts with this dash dash and then the name of the property and a value. I'm defining this in the uh, styles CSS style sheet, which is in the in the like root of my team. So these will be available anywhere in the in the application DOM structure. Um, I'm using the uh, design tokens that just show, shown on the or defined in the in the previous slide. So we are introducing primary, secondary, tertiary color variables, and also to uh, font family stacks. As of yet, these won't do anything, anything. So you need to start connecting these to your applications styles. So uh, Lumo comes with these uh, CSS variables, and here we are defining that the Lumo primary color is, for example, using or referencing the uh, create primary color. So now on the screenshot on the right, we can see that all the components turned from the blue color into this uh, red color. So we don't need to do any like a uh, component specific styling. We don't need to pick into every single component separately, but we are doing it in the, in the shared styles for all the, uh, the whole application in, at once. So Lumo has uh, dozens of these variables that you can configure in, the, in this manner. The next modification we do is we change the Lumo border radius to be 0.5 REM units. So everything comes a bit more rounded. And as the last modification, we configure the Lumo font family to again use the create body font variable that we, that we introduced earlier. So now with a couple lines of CSS, we have done, done changes to the whole application. So using, using the CSS variables uh, makes your styles 
consistent, easier to modify and easier, easier to maintain. So you should be avoiding uh, hard-coded values like uh, pixel sizes or hex colors in your, in your code. And that's kind of a code smell that, okay, this should probably be a variable instead. Um, here in the, in the first sample, uh, we have a button with a class name orange. And again, there using the variables, we are setting a background and a border radius. In the second sample, uh, we have a employees view and a filters section uh, within the employees view. And we are setting a background color and a gap property, for example. Here I'm uh, placing the first one in a, in a components style and the next one in the, in the view styles. There's nothing specific in how those are loaded, so they all end up in the, in the same level. So how to find these uh, CSS variables? The first resource is to look into, into Lumo documentation. It lists all the variables that, that come, come with Lumo. The second way is using your favorite browser, opening up, up the inspector, focusing the HTML element and uh, the styles uh, tab in the inspector will list all of these variables that you have available. Now we've been mostly looking into colors, but there's sizing variables and, and other things as well. Relying uh, your styles on these variables makes it easy to create uh, theme modes, which is a quite, quite nice or useful, useful technique. So Lumo out of the box comes with this uh, support for a dark mode. Well, what it does is that uh, it changes the values for selected variables in the scope of the uh, dark theme attribute. So there's no automatic translation between the light and dark mode. Uh, so if you do changes in your light mode, say uh, change the primary color, you need to do those changes in the dark mode manually as well. It's uh, useful for other things than, than uh, having the dark mode. So here's a few examples on what we have done for some of our customers' applications. So you might introduce a high contrast mode where the font color is modified or the input field backgrounds are modified. And you're doing that with just configuring CSS variables instead of duplicating your whole team and serving a, serving a different theme. Another uh, thing you could do is achieve this kind of like end customer branding. So based in the log, uh, logged in user, you might serve a different color palette or change a logo of the application if that's defined in your, in your styling. So again, you don't need to duplicate the whole style or, or the whole team of the, of the application. A UX principle that is advisable is to allow the end users to uh, have options to customize the, the UI to their liking. So it's probably not a good idea to uh, offer like a full customization of all the styles, but instead you could introduce presets and let the users to pick from those presets. An example of this could be uh, enabling like a compact sizing for, all, for the whole application that can be done with tweaking, tweaking the variables or you could do it on a, on a like a component level that uh, for grid, for example, we are making the rows a bit more dense or they could be more like spread out if, if it's uh, easier to read in that way. So these are, these are fairly easy to maintain because we are just tweaking not like one or two variables in, in these and making, making changes to those. Next, uh, we're moving like one step higher in the hierarchy and Rolf will be telling a bit about styling components. Yes. So um, I would say that the first step you should do when you find that you need to change the appearance of a component is to check for the built-in style variants. Uh, I'm sure you're all aware that we have a few different types of buttons. We have the primary, the secondary, the tertiary button, and then we have the danger or the error, as, as it's for some reason called in, in Lumo, uh, styles which uh, change the coloring of the buttons. So uh, instead of starting from scratch, you could first see if do we already, does a variant that 
fits what you need to do, does it already exist? And even if it do doesn't uh, itself, uh, even, if, even if it's not enough for what you need, maybe it takes you a bit closer to where you need to go so you could use that as a starting point instead of doing it from scratch. So if you want to do, for example, a uh, button without any kind of background, but it do doesn't look exactly like the tertiary button in Lumo, you could still apply the tertiary uh, variant to the button and then uh, do some other styling on top of that. So for example, uh, the grid has a whole bunch of different um, variants for doing borders and stripes and a compact, uh, compact uh, variant that reduces the padding in the grid cells. So most components, I would say, have some kind of style variants and they're all documented in the component documentation. Um, so once uh, uh, you've checked the built-in style variants and you actually need to start making some customizations, by far the easiest way to do that is to still keep using those uh, variables, those Lumo variables or style properties that you also just talked about. So um, you also was mainly talking in terms of the global styles of the entire application, but there's no, no reason uh, that you couldn't scope those styles, the, the values that you give to those variables for, for example, individual component instances. So the number field here has, for example, uh, a background color that defaults to Lumo contrast 10%. So it's one of the 10 uh, grayscales of various uh, opacities that we have in Lumo. And then there's also actually a hidden border, a border that is hidden by default. This is new in Vardin 24.0, I think. Um, and it's invisible by default, but there are two variables that control its appearance. There's the Vardin input field border width and the Vardin input field border color. And the only thing you need to do is uh, to make it visible is to set the width to something like one pixel. So let's say that we, for example, want to, um, we want to apply a warning style to the number field. So we apply a class name, warning, and then we write a CSS block that has value number field, the type of the field, and then dot, which is the CSS class name selector, and warning, the name of the class name. And so within that block, we just apply three variable values. We set Lumo contrast 10% to lemon chiffon, which is a pale yellow color. And then we set the Vardin input field border width to one pixel. And then we set the Vardin input field border color to orange. And that gives us this. So yes, technically you, sorry, it gives you this. So yes, technically um, it, you have written some CSS here. Uh, but you haven't really had to target any specific parts of the component because you're just tweaking the values of variables that are already used by the component. So, okay, what if you've done that and it still doesn't get you where, where you need to go? There just aren't any particular variables that can get you there. Well, that takes us to actually writing CSS for specific parts of the components. And um, as most of you, maybe all of you know, since Vardin 10, the Vardin components have uh, contained something called a shadow DOM. It's a web component feature that uh, isolates the internal structure, the internal HTML of the component from the surrounding page. And there are good technical reasons to want to have that, but the drawback is that you can't just target parts inside of the component with, uh, you know, the usual kind of CSS that you would expect. One thing that does get, get past this shadow DOM boundary are those variables. So variables don't care about the shadow DOM. They, uh, they, will, be, uh, they will apply to elements inside of the shadow DOM just fine. So um, previously in Vardin 23 and earlier, 
uh, there was a way to inject CSS into the shadow DOM of those components. And we still do have that in volume 24, but this is the way that you did it in volume 23 and earlier. If you had a theme folder, uh, you, could have, you would have a component subfolder in that folder, and then within the components folder, you would have a style sheet whose name matches the component that you want to inject CSS into. So if you want to inject CSS into the shadow DOM of the Vardin text field, you would call that style sheet Vardin dash text dash field dot CSS. Um, even earlier, like in Vardin 14, you typically use the CSS import annotation in flow. And uh, that takes two parameters, the value, which is the name of the style sheet, which can be anything, and uh, the theme for parameter, which again is the name of the component whose shadow DOM you want to inject CSS into. Now, none of these are a thing anymore. Well, they do exist. You can still use them. But you don't need to use them in Vardin 24, and the recommended approach in Vardin 24 is no longer this but instead it's based on the new part selector. So the part selector is actually a standard native CSS selector. Um, the reason we couldn't use it previously is that our components internal structure didn't really support it. So we refactored our components so that we, they could support the part selector properly. So the part selector uh, basically allows you to target with regular CSS without injecting anything anywhere, without worrying about the names of style sheets or anything. It allows you to inject, uh, like kind of access uh, elements in the shadow DOM through regular CSS. So if you look uh, with the browser's uh, dev tools uh, at the HTML structure of a voting component, you will see a lot of elements in there that have a part attribute, the ones highlighted here. Uh, in the code snippet. And so the part selector matches that by, uh, when, when you type the name of that part inside of the parentheses in the selector. So for example, var in text field, colon, colon, part, input field, targets the input field part, which is the, um, well, you see it in the code snippet over there. So that way you can actually, for example, set the background of the input field part to red if you want to. So um, the part selector can be used, can be combined with other selectors in various ways. So for example, uh, well, if you just want to target the input field, you just use the part selector on a specific component. If you want to target uh, the text field when it's invalid, and you want to target the input field part of the text field in that spe specific state, you can combine the part selector with an attribute selector invalid, uh, which maps to uh, the at invalid attribute on the component. Or if you want to apply a class name to the component, like search field, you add that attribute, uh, that class name selector after the component name, and then the part selector comes last. As you can see the pattern here, the part selector is always the last part of the selector. There's only two cases where you can add anything after the part selector, and that's before, after, hover. Those are called pseudo elements or, or, or um, uh, pseudo, what are they called? Anyway, like states basically, like mm -hmm. hover and focus and so on. Yeah. Um, so what you can do is you can omit everything before the part selector. If you don't want to target a specific type of component, you can just write colon colon part input field and that will target any component that contains a part called input field. So for example, that would apply to pretty much every single body in input field. And then finally, if you want to exclude a component, for example, if you want to style the input fields, uh, input, input field parts of all the components except for the Vardin number field, you could do colon not Vardin number field and then colon colon part uh, input field. So it can be combined in a lot of ways. Uh, here's an example of the various parts in a Vardin text field. And um, 
we have added a styling tab in the component pages in the documentation where you will find a list of hopefully all of the various selectors that you will need to style that component. I mean, it's not a necessarily an exhaustive list. There are combinations of, of selectors that you can use that aren't covered in the documentation, but you will probably be able to figure those out on your own if you know a little bit of CSS. So this documentation lists all of the part names, all of the states like invalid and so on, and all of the other child elements that you can uh, access normally through CSS. So uh, another way you can figure out what those uh, parts are uh, is to use the browser's DOM inspector and just look at what is inside of the component. And then there's the third way, which is the new exciting thing, the theme editor. Uh, was it Jonas or Leif who, who already showed you something of this yesterday? So the theme editor is something you can bring up from the, the, the Vadin DevTool uh, widget uh, in the lower right corner. And um, it's a tool for theming. So you can uh, target a specific component. There's a, a button that uh, you allows you to pick a component similar to a color picker, for example. So you focus a component and then you can tweak uh, the styling of the component by sliding those sliders and, and well, changing the values in those fields. Either globally for all the buttons or one specific instance of it. Yes, of there's a, a drop down at the top there that says local in this screenshot. Uh, you can, that's a, a drop down, you can switch it to uh, uh, global, which will apply that styling to all instances of that component. So it's super useful if you just want to uh, figure out how to do something in CSS or like uh, if, you, if you're not sure how to do something, you can do it there first and then maybe continue writing CSS uh, manually. Or you can even totally avoid writing any CSS by just doing all your styling in this thing. So for example, uh, as you can see here, this is the default look for that field, but we can tweak some sliders and we can give it a border. We can make the corners sharp and we can uh, remove the background color and stuff like that. And then when you uh, go into your IDE or editor and uh, to see what has happened there, you will actually see that the changes that the theme editor has done uh, can be found in a special style sheet called themeeditor.css in your theme folder. So, and there's a comment there that says created by Vadin theme editor. So, um, all the styles that you do with the theme editor go there. Uh, in order to keep things organized, like Yusa was uh, showing you uh, a bit earlier, uh, you might want to at some point move them away from there to a style sheet specific for that component, for example. But that's where they go by default. Um, you can also um, you can also um, find the stylable parts for each component by using the theme editor. So when you look at the UI here, you'll see that there's a, a few sections, like there's a section called label and there's a section called helper text and so on. So those are the parts, the stylable parts of this component. Not all of them necessarily, because the theme editor is still new, it doesn't cover everything, but it does cover a decent amount of them. And you can tweak the styles in the editor directly, or if you would just want to figure out the selector and write the CSS for that part yourself, there's the edit CSS button that is highlighted in red on the top uh, right-ish area. When you click that button, that will actually open that, uh, you, that will actually um, open your IDE uh, with a selector already generated for that part. So that gives you like super quick access to figuring out the correct selector for a part. So for example, if you click the edit CSS uh, button for the label here that uh, we're highlighting, you will find a block with the body text field, colon, colon, part, label in the theme editor.css file. So there's one last thing, which is partially already there and partially upcoming. 
I already hinted at this in an earlier slide where we set the border width and the border color of that warning uh, text field. So these are two relatively new uh, properties, style properties that we've added. They are not global LUMO properties in the sense that they affect all the components. These are specific to certain component types and certain parts of those components. So for example, the VADIN input field, border width and color properties, those affect every single one of the VADIN input field components. And we are currently working on more of these. Uh, like for example, we will have a VADIN input field background property, a VADIN input field label font size property, and a VADIN button text color property, and so on and so on. Uh, we have uh, a, a ton of these new style properties coming up in VADIN 24.3, which ships in December. So the nice thing about these component or feature specific properties is that uh, you, can be, you can be certain that they don't affect any other features. The problem with the global LUMO properties are that let's say that you change the LUMO contrast 10% property that I showed you in the beginning with the warning, uh, warning field. That one property is not just used for the field background, it's used for a gazillion other things in VADIN components. So if you don't want to affect every single place where that color is used, but you only want to affect, for example, the input field backgrounds, that's kind of difficult to do with the LUMO property. So that's why we are introducing these component and feature specific properties that allow you to tweak the styles of, for example, every single input field, regardless of its type, without having to write actual CSS, without having to figure out the selectors to target all of those components and the correct part of those components. So all you need to do is use the correct property name and give it a value and you're done. So it gives like a very safe way of, of modifying the styles. Yes. So then we are moving to the uh, third step in the hierarchy to the top and that was the view styles. So as I mentioned, there shouldn't be too many of these. The recurring patterns should be uh, becoming components instead. But sometimes like one off styling is needed in, in very specific views. So here uh, I'm showing an example uh, of, a, of a view with a filter area, a, a grid. And in here to start writing writing styles, you need to uh, first add some class names to be used as, a, as targets in your CSS. So in, in Java, we used to add class name. We add a, a employees view class name. And in the flex layout uh, consisting the filters, we add a class name filters. Then switching over to CSS, uh, first of all, we have a neatly organized employees view style sheet separately inside the view, view styles directory in, in the team. And there we are referencing the same class names. So employees view and filters and setting a background and using a variable uh, for, the, for the background color. Now uh, there's an alternative way of, of doing this directly from Java code. So writing inline styles in Java is, is not really recommended, but instead uh, we have these LUMO utilities, which are basically enums with the most common styling options that you have. So you can define background colors, borders, box shadows, sizing, spacing, typography things, and adjust the layouts and, and do flexbox tweaks using the uh, utility classes. So in the sample, uh, instead of adding a, a class name to be targeted in the CSS, we uh, use a, still add a class name, but reference to the uh, LUMO utility enums. So there's a LUMO utility dot background dot contrast five, which refers to the LUMO contrast 5% color value. So it provides a quite nice developer experience because you can browse these enums in your, in your IDE directly. So you don't need to know every LUMO variable by, by heart. So 
uh, we can do more with these uh, utility classes. Here I added two lines, so we are changing the vertical padding to be uh, small and also we are doing a modification to the flexbox, changing that from row to column. There's some uh, pros and cons uh, to, to the utility classes. So the positive things is, are that uh, you can do this directly from Java code. Uh, it will be very consistent because you're relying on the, on the established set of, of uh, style properties and, and variables. Uh, there's less need for those kind of like one-liner CSS small adjustments like changing a gap in, in, a, in a layout. So it's, it's really good fit for layout, layout tweaks, I'd say. On the downsides, is, it's that uh, your use of the utility classes, if you're, for example, using the styling to uh, draw a card, a background and a padding and a box shadow, that might become very repetitive quickly. So then you should be uh, drying up your code and, and defining that as a pattern, maybe using a class name instead for, for like a set of styles that you're always applying or introduce a, a, your own enum uh, like triggering those those plans. Um, also what you can't do is uh, custom CSS you can't target any states of the components you can't do responsive styles using the using the utility classes and kind of what you need to be aware of is that it's kind of uh, breaking your styles in two places that some styling is done in Java code, some is in the style sheets. So you kind of need to plan your approach with this. My personal experience is that I'm using this all the time for layouting, layouting adjustments and, and more, the more complicated styling I'm placing in the, in the style sheets. Another new thing that helps in the uh, view level styles is the component locator. So this is again uh, something new in the, in the dev tools and new in 1.24. So it's quite useful in, in large and complex projects that you can enable the tool, point and click on a component and it will open up the IDE and uh, the corresponding line, highlight the corresponding line <coughs> in there. So it's just a great tool for, for finding the elements because sometimes the, the UIs can get quite complex. So that's basically the different techniques uh, we have for styling, styling applications. You should be putting extra effort in defining your shared styles well because that's what you're referencing most of the time. You shouldn't be writing new ad hoc styles too much. Uh, use the CSS variables, avoid the hard-coded values to be flexible uh, to allow having those different T modes. For component styling, use the part selector. Uh, there's tons of uh, DOM updates on the, on the components on the latest versions to make better, better use of that. So everything that is kind of intended to be stylable easily is now, now a, defined as a part. Well, part or not everything is defined as a part. Mm. There are other regular CS, uh, HTML child elements as well that you can target without right. part selector, but anyway. Yeah. And uh, for the like view styling, do look into this Lumo utilities and, and style, uh, use, it, use it to style your application directly from, from Java code. And if there's one takeaway I'd like you to have from this, from this presentation is the CSS variables. Get familiar with those. You can all already use those with any, any project you have. It's standard, standard CSS. It's nothing that we invented, which is, which is very nice. It kind of promotes keeping your styles very consistent and, and easy, to, easy to maintain. So here's some additional resources. The theming tutorials have been now updated to uh, follow, follow the mentioned techniques here. And also I have to mention that if you need any help with uh, creating visual concepts, implementing your styles of writing CSS, uh, help with defining a design system, help with accessibility topics or anything at all related to UI or UX, we are very happy to help, we help you with those, those topics. Do we have any questions for theming and styling? Yes. 
still the like this Java API for like set width and set height and stuff like that. Do you see any use case for that at all, or do you regret adding it in purpose? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so the question, uh, I'll just re repeat the questions. So the question is that, well, there we still have the, of course, the Java APIs for setting widths and heights and so on. And so, uh, <laughs> like, is there still a use case for that? And do we kind of regret adding those APIs in the first place? Um, I mean, it's, uh, I personally, I use them a lot. Um, but on the other hand, uh, most of the time what I do with the, with, with the uh, size API in Flow is to set size full mm. or set width full or set height full. I rarely do anything except set something to 100%. Um, that being said, if you want to split your UI into something that is exactly 300 pixels wide and the rest is like takes the rest of the space, there's no reason <coughs> not to do that in, the, in, in your Flow code. It all depends on, on whether you want to try to keep all your sizing, size styling also in CSS. But even then there's two ways you can do that. You can apply a class name to the component and then write that, that size in CSS. Or if you have it defined as a variable, like dash dash my sidebar width, then you can apply that width in Java code. You do set width bar parenthesis dash dash my sidebar width parenthesis. So you can, that, the, the var uh, CSS function that you use to consume a CSS variable is just a regular CSS value, just like any, any other CSS value. And you can use that as the value also in flow when you set sizes to things. So, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't think there's anything wrong with the API. Maybe we should have, should have just like uh, had a really, really convenient API for setting everything size full. Hmm. But, well, we do have size full now. Yeah, but it also, also kind of improves the legibility of the styling when you're using those instead of kind of hiding <laughs> all the layouting things in, in, in your style. So it's a, like, yeah, flavors. I guess it can be more easy to understand the UI code in Java if you're if you're not uh, delegating everything to CSS. Yeah. That's kind of why, why where I'm also drawing the border that the layouting I prefer doing in in Java code Java, while yeah. the like visual things I'm more, more, more moving to the CSS style. But it's it's a it's a it depends. Taste, <laughs> taste. <laughs> Do we have time for okay? You there? Except for the Java parts. Uh, oh, good question. Can somebody tell me if uh, uh, the theme editor is works with Hilla? No. Nope. No, it doesn't. Not okay. No. For the parts, <laughs> the CSS variables. That's that's the same in there. Every everything else, everything else also works with Hilla. I mean, all all of the CSS stuff is is equally valid there. Yeah. Uh, we had one more question over there. How likely is it that Lumo default styles will change in future releases? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I think we have gone quite far in, in trying to avoid that. Uh, the changes that, that have happened that have probably broken some of your themes is that we refactored the HTML structure of the components. And we did that for a couple of reasons primarily. One was for accessibility and the other one was to make theming easier. So when we, in order to make theming easier, we had to break some of your themes. Sorry. <laughs> uh, but uh, the default Lumo proper, uh, Lumo values are, I'm not saying they will never change, but I think it's very unlikely that we will change anything but like some really minor things. We did make some tweaks, some small tweaks to the values, to the default values of, of those variables. We changed the, for example, the secondary text color to be a bit darker for better accessibility. We changed the primary colors to be, you know, we changed the, we did some minor tweaks to the hues. 
and we did that for for uh, uh, WCAG compliance for accessibility. We are not no. changing blue to red. No, minor, minor tweaks, and only for uh, very good reasons. We really try to avoid touching those as far as we can. And also introducing those uh, component-specific variables is not going to be a breaking change. There's kind of like a layer in between. Yes, so. that too. Yeah, the, those new those new uh, feature-specific uh, uh, properties or CSS variables that we're introducing will not affect any existing themes. They will have zero effect on until you decide to give them a value. As soon as you give a value to one of those properties, it will kind of come into existence. But otherwise, it won't have any effect on anything. Out of time, I think. Yeah, or, I think so. Yeah, but we can continue taking questions uh, outside afterwards. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you.